QCD and condensed matter. So without further ado, Ira, take it away. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks uh, for inviting me. Um, so um, I'd like to talk today about some work that I've been doing with um, Alberto Nicolas over the past uh, quite some time. Uh, there's no paper on it yet, but hopefully there will be in the not too distant future. Um, so what I want to talk to uh, today about is um, is sort of alternative uh, alternative ideas for understanding what apparently are fine tunings in field theory. So uh, as we all know, I don't have to go uh, into much detail about the fine tuning problems uh, that present uh, that are presented to us today, uh, especially those who are interested in the field of of high energy physics. Um, but just let me briefly, uh, for, um, for context, uh, discuss the three main ones or three main archetypes of, of, of fine tunings. Um, so um, of course we have the, the uh, cosmological constant problem, which is sort of the mother of all fine tuning problems. Um, it goes to the standard model hierarchy And um, a third class of problems would be one like the strong CP problem. So I want to distinguish these fine tunings um, based upon um, the, the nature of the operators. So um, these two uh, fine tunings are uh, fine tunings of relevant operators. Whereas a strong CP problem is a fine tuning of a marginal operator. And so um, one could sort of categorize, group the, the, the relevant operators as being uh, radiatively uh, unstable, sensitive to, um, uh, to the cutoff. Whereas a, a problem where marginal coupling um, looks to be fine-tuned is uh, more a question of the notion that Dirac gave us that all dimensionless couplings in an action uh, should be order one. Um, the approaches to the solution to these problems are also quite distinct. So typically when we approach either the CC or the standard model hierarchy, well, uh, we could do uh, there are three basic approaches to this problem that at least I can think of. One is um, symmetries. So impose some symmetry in the UV, such as SUSY, um, such that above, above some scale, this symmetry forbids uh, this term. And so it's naturally of order whatever that symmetry breaking scale is. Uh, Another approach, say, would be uh, technicolor, where um, whereby uh, we essentially have no, there exists no uh, operators of dimension two that would correspond to a Higgs mass. No such operators exist. Uh, that are gauge invariant. So we set up a gauge theory where there's no dimension to gauge invariant operators. Um, or um, we could build models uh, based either on, on holographic models or on strong coupling, however you decide to think about it, where the Higgs mass or what was some operator which was say dimension two canonically, um, due to strong coupling actually gets dimensions that look like a four minus epsilon. So it, while it may be large at the high scale, or I should say um, the, the no, high, no, no large hierarchy is generated because the running is just so small through the decades of energy scales. So these approaches uh, are approaches to solving the cosmological constant problem. Um, but the strong CP problem um, has its own brand of solution um, uh, that in the very elegant Pecci-Quinn mechanism. 
uh, which I'll call a relaxation mechanism for the rest of this talk. So the way Petchy Quinn works is um, we have some, uh, our, our, our coupling, our G, our theta, is actually the zero mode of some field, which uh, turns out to be a Goldstone boson, okay? And so um, the coupling, as you all know, the FF dual, so L looks something like this, and the strong interaction generates a potential for this uh, zero mode, and um, it naturally relaxes to zero in the ground state, right? So this is the relaxation mechanism. And uh, is um, really a beautiful, elegant solution to the strong CP problem. Of course, whether or not it turns out to correctly describe nature is yet to be determined. So um, now this mechanism of relaxation can also be applied to uh, problems of fine tunings of relevant operators. Um, and the first that I know of, the first attempt at doing so was by, um, by Larry Abbott when he tried to uh, attack the cosmological constant problem. So he essentially moderated, uh, modulated the axion potential with a linear potential. And his idea was, um, it's a beautiful idea that you have some potential, which is function of phi. And what happens is, is that um, when you're sitting at this metastable vacuum here, the cosmological constant is so large that you're in De Sitter space where essentially the temperature is large enough so that you easily go over this barrier. And then you keep coming down until the cosmological constant is sufficiently small <coughs> that you can't get over these barriers anymore. So um, of course this, this model has problems because there's no reheating. So you end up with, um, uh, with um, uh, an empty universe. So phenomenologically it's not viable, but still uh, it presents to us a paradigm um, which worthy of exploration. And in fact, there's been recent activity in the past few years on applying the same ideas basic ideas to, um, to, the, to the hierarchy problem in the form of the rela relaxion and uh, associated models, <coughs> which utilize this relaxation mechanism in the uh, context of a cosmological evolution of the universe. Um, so th these approaches, um, I think, are definitely worthy of further exploration. Uh, given our lack of evidence for um, um, for the, these types, this type of UV sort of approach, then maybe we should be exploring IR approaches uh, more thoroughly. IR approaches meaning relaxation mechanisms type of approaches to this problem. Um, now, it seems like, well, okay, I have to it doesn't seem like a very generic setup, right? I have to somehow, I have to couple to some sector in the case of Abbott's model that has instantons and uh, I have to do some model building and, and, and uh, I have to do a little bit of work uh, in order to get some relaxation mechanism. But um, so what I'd like to tell you about today is uh, in the work I did with Alberto is that maybe these uh, relaxation mechanisms are much more prevalent than we think. It's just that we have to relax some assumptions that we've been making in the past. So in fact, um, relaxed systems uh, abound and apparently fine-tuned systems exist all around us. So uh, I can present to you an example immediately, which is this pen. If I write down the action for this pen, for the transverse oscilla oscillations, it looks something like this. Okay. And if you stare at this for just a second, you realize there's something very odd. Uh, and what is odd is this term is conspicuously missing. There's no gradient energy in the action for this pen. There's no, at, at first order gradients in derivatives. So there's no symmetry, 
that protects this term. And so it naively looks like, well, we have an apparently a very finely tuned problem. Um, so uh, let's, let's try to understand that. So um, let, me, uh, let me briefly uh, sort of understand, try to explain the energetics of, of, um, of a bar. So let me understand the, the field theory description of a bar. So here I have some bar, which is defined as a solid, uh, but with you know one length, one side um, parametrically smaller, or I should say um, hierarchically smaller than the other side. Okay. And I want to ask, what is the energy density or finite temperature? What is the free energy of the system uh, as I start to bend it? So if I bend it, something like that. Let me define this angle theta. So um, if I look at the, what happens energetically to the bar, then I notice that on this side, I have compression. And on this side of the bar, I have stretching. Okay, and there's one line down the middle, which we'll call, which is usually called the neutral surface, which is not feeling any tension at all because it's not stretched. Now, what's crucial here uh, is, is that the ends are free to move. There's no clamps, there's no constraints, and there's no <coughs> external, external tension, okay? Now I want to calculate what the energy density of the system is. So um, the free energy is given by uh, the stress times the strain. So the strain is basically um, so where delta x j is the displacement from equilibrium. Okay. Now, um, uh, I want to use, uh, I'm going to make an assumption of small, uh, small gradients, right? So we're looking at the low energy effective theory. So in that limit, we know that the stress um, is linearly related to the strain by, by a Young's modulus. Okay. Um, Actually, I think I have it the other way around, sorry. Okay, now, now where do our assumptions come in? Well, the first assumption is, is that there's uh, free boundaries. And as a consequence of that, um, if I look at the stresses normal to the surface, uh, those are all zero, okay? And uh, let me define my coordinate system so it looks like this. So this is Z is along the, uh, the axis of the equilibrium position of the bar, okay? Now, the other assumption I'm gonna make is, is that if I call this distance L1 and this distance L2, I'm gonna assume that L1 is much, much less than L2, okay? Now, as a consequence of these two assumptions, the only non-vanishing stress is TZZ. And similarly, the only non-vanishing strain is along the Z direction, okay? Um, so now we can apply this to our free energy. So we know our free energy is gonna go something like the Young's modulus squared um, times um, the, uh, the square of um, I just the square of uh, the stress. Okay, actually, I, I think it's I should write in terms of the strain. Okay, so the question is, what is this displacement u z z? If I call this distance the radius of curvature r, then um, u z z.
goes like x over r, where x now is the displacement of a point from the neutral surface. So I'm going to call that x. So you can work out the geometry, and it's relatively simple to show that this is true. So f goes like 1 over the square of the radius of curvature. But the radius of curvature is the second derivative of the displacement with respect to z. And so we see that there's no gradient energy. There's only the square. The second uh, derivative is the only contribution to the free energy. Okay. So, um, so the crucial assumptions that go into this whole energetic argument are exactly these. Okay. So how do we understand this? This is sort of the microscopic description. This, we could think of this as the UV matching onto the theory. But we'd really like to match on instead is to consider first, let us first consider a solid with essentially equal sides, uh, equal area sides, OK? So, let's, uh, so now we'd like to give it an EFT description. Okay, so we need to understand the EFT of a solid if we want to um, use all our standard algorithms to write down an action and really try to understand this from an EFT point as opposed to just matching, knowing what the full theory is. Okay, so um, how do we describe an EFT of a solid? So um, we, uh, a simple way to think about it is in terms of the symmetry breaking pattern. So what is the symmetry breaking pattern for a solid? Okay, so when uh, we have all our space-time symmetries, and I'm going to work with Galilean symmetries, um, uh, even though we could do Lorentz, but it doesn't really matter. Um, so we have our uh, we have translations, boosts, rotations, and time translations. But in addition, we have uh, emergent symmetries. Main, uh, namely, we have a translational symmetry as well as a rotational symmetry, which are, so these are, these are the usual space time. And these are emergent internal symmetries. In the sense that if I have a solid, and I'm gonna assume it's, it's homogeneous, it's uh, at long distances, then um, if I translate uh, this particle to here and this particle to here, then the system is left unchanged. And similarly for rotations at long distances. Okay, now the, the uh, so I'm going to, to choose a coordinate uh, set of uh, degrees of freedom, which I'm gonna call phi i x of t, uh, which is um, sometimes called the co-moving coordinates. This is also sometimes called the Lagrangian description, as opposed to the Eulerian, uh, which I'll explain in, uh, in a little bit. Well, maybe, maybe I should do it now. The Eulerian description would be xi of phi of t. So let me tell you physically what this means. So phi i of x is the label of the atom at position x. Okay, and th therefore, and there, this thinking about it in this way, xi would be the space time position of the atom labeled by phi i. So, those are the two ways of thinking about the problem. And depending on what you want to calculate, one description may be more um, useful than the other. Okay, so um, now this phi i, we can, uh, phi i gets an expectation value in the ground state. And I can choose my coordinate system so that this is just the coordinates itself. In other words, in the ground state where the bar or the solid is just sitting still, I'm going to label each position, each atom by its uh, coordinate. Okay, and that 
that label will live with it for the rest of its life, no matter where it moves. Now, this, um, this ground state uh, breaks um, many of the symmetries. So in particular, it's going to break translations. It's going to break boosts and rotations. And it's also going to break the internal translations. But there'll be unbroken diagonal subgroups. So in particular, uh, T plus P and L plus R. Because if I, <coughs> if I translate by relabeling to this point, I can get back to the original configuration by translating in space time in the opposite direction. Okay, so there's an unbroken, these are the unbroken symmetries. And you can see that we're going to have um, uh, 3, 6, 9, 12, 15 broken generators uh, minus um, uh, 6. So nine broken generators. So we th might think we have nine goldstones, but we actually have three. And this is, of course, uh, a well-known fact about space-time symmetry breaking that goldstone, goldstone's theorem uh, doesn't apply in, as it does relativistically. There's no one-to-one -one correspondence between broken generators and goldstones. So I'm not going to go into the details of this, but one can show that what can eliminate all the other goldstones and just leave over three, and those three goldstones correspond exactly to the phonon, which, um, which, uh, which are just our phi eyes. Okay. Uh, also, so feel free to uh, to interrupt me if there are, if there are questions. Uh, but I won't be looking at the at the chat. So uh, speak up, please. Okay. Okay, I will I will take care of it. Okay, thank you, Michelle. Um, okay, so now we want to build an action. Okay, so. Um, the way we do that is we write down uh, the most general, oops, let me do it for D dimensions. We're now notice that I've allowed for, uh, allowed for non-trivial power counting. Okay, so normally in an, effective, in an effective theory, we would say that this object has to be much less than one, but clearly we have to change that power counting because if we look at this VEV, we would never be able to search that range of parameter space. <laughs> so instead we're gonna uh, take a power counting where D squared phi uh, over phi, um, sorry, uh, D squared phi, is much, much less than uh, d phi over phi. Okay, so we're gonna allow large first derivatives, but second derivatives will be, um, uh, will be uh, parametrically suppressed in our power counting. So um, we're gonna expand around our vacuum. Um, and then uh, we can write out the action, and I'm not going to go through the details of it, but you, of course, just looks like the action of a solid with some longitudinal modes, some transverse modes, and then gradient terms for both, some velocities. Plus nonlinearities. Okay. So um, at this point, uh, we haven't said anything about whether or not the solid, so I'm just talking about generic solid here. I haven't said anything about what the boundary conditions are. Okay. And in particular, we want to impose free boundary conditions. So we want to impose our free boundary conditions. And moreover, we haven't even used the fact that the target space phi i is bounded, right? 
we only have a finite number of atoms that are making are composing our system. So how are we gonna let's how are we gonna impose this boundedness? So let me define a function g of phi i, which is zero outside the solid. Okay. And uh, we'll say that g phi i is greater inside the solid. Okay. So now our action, we're gonna write as theta of phi, and I'm gonna choose a very simple form for pi. I'm gonna take it to be rectangular. So I'm gonna take this to be phi zero i minus phi i. And I'm just going to impose that theta function on my action. And this will automatically account for the fact that the target space is bounded. Okay. So now if I calculate the stress energy tensor, <coughs> excuse me. where this is the, the bulk stress energy tensor, the one I would get in any, it's a local object that doesn't depend on the boundary conditions. So d mu t twiddle mu nu is zero, but if I look at d mu t mu nu, right? What do I get? I get delta of theta i minus theta zero i d mu phi I T mu nu, okay? And um, so this is a statement about what happens at the boundary. This delta function <coughs> tells us we're sitting at the boundary <coughs> and this has to be zero, okay? So in particular, um, now if I, if I look at the expectation value in the ground state, then I find that T um, I J has to be zero at the boundary. But this also implies that T I J has to be zero everywhere. And, and, and let me show you now why that's true. So if I calculate T mu nu, then it's given by something like this. Um, let me uh, remember F is a function of this object, which I'm going to call Bij. <clears throat> okay. And if I impose that Tij in the ground state is zero at the boundary, then this tells me that delta F dBij is equal to one half delta Ij. Okay. So this has implications for the couplings in the action. So if I now expand the action, that we come, if we come back to the action, which we wrote down here, there are these couplings here, which are the velocities. And in addition, there's a cosmological constant, lambda, which is nothing but F. So lambda is equal to F. And df, B, D, uh, df D, B, I, J is related to the velocities. So we have uh, the, the leading order action has three free parameters, Vf, uh, sorry, Vt and V, v longitudinal and V transverse. And one relation that lambda is a known function of V transverse and V longitudinal, which I could just work out just from, the, from, uh, from expanding the action and looking at what this term is here. So uh, this in itself looks like a fine tuning, right? I have some solid, I have three parameters that describe the low energy theory. 
they should be independent from the UV point of view, but from the IR point of view, we only have two free parameters. Okay, so in this sense, this is no more or less shocking than the bar, where in that case, there's only one, uh, one parameter that just has to vanish as opposed to three parameters, which have one relation between them. And the whole reason um, this occurs is because of our uh, open boundary conditions or the fact that more importantly, uh, perhaps that the target space is bounded. So let's see what happens in the case of a bar. So now let's consider the bar. Okay, so the bar is uh, uh, some, <coughs> is gonna be some 1D field theory. And so the question is, uh, what is the action for a bar? Well, one might naively think it's just the Nambu go-to action, um, but of course that's not right because uh, we actually have atoms here, which we can label. And so there is no reparameterization of variance along that, uh, that space-like direction. So uh, we have more than just the Nambu go-to action. We have an extra degree of freedom which corresponds to the longitudinal oscillations of the atoms in those directions. So we can write down the action, which looks like this. Where F is some arbitrary function, which depends on the UV completion of the theory. And G alpha beta is the, is the induced metric. Okay. So now we have um, seemingly too many degrees of freedom, uh, but we have, <coughs> we still have um, RPI to, uh, to choose. So we can choose say, uh, and X3 will be equal to sigma, okay? So our degrees of freedom now are phi I, where this is one and two, uh, sorry, XI, and then phi, which is a longitudinal, okay? Now we're, we're gonna only be interested in, um, in, uh, in this degree of freedom, because that's the one which is gonna have vanishing um, gradient energy. Okay, so we approach this problem the same way uh, we did the solid in that we write S is equal to d tau d sigma theta of, of phi, uh, sorry, phi minus phi times, uh, let's call this S twiddle. Okay. Uh, now this, so the stress energy tensor, which follows from this action, uh, what I call the, tw the twiddle stress energy tensor, is easily extracted and therefore following the same line of argument that we had before. Tells us that the T three uh, in any direction uh, at the boundary is equal to zero on the ground state. Okay, and then taking the expectation value of this guy in the ground state tells us that F in the ground state, which is again like 
we found before, this condition has to be satisfied. And now if we expand the action around the ground state, uh, then we find that it looks something like this, um, or actually even if we just look at the equations of motion, then the equations of motion look like this. But now this term is zero. And so in order to get a non-vanishing term, we have to look at higher derivative corrections to the action. Uh, Ira, can I, can I ask one question? Sure. Yeah, so by the way, this is Songo. So um, I feel that the, the level of uh, say tuning and the form uh, uh, of tuning seems to be in one-to-one -one correspondence to um, the information you put about the boundary and boundary conditions. So for example, yeah. instead of yeah. a step function like a cutting, if you say it goes smoothly uh, over to the zero-ness, then I guess you might get slightly different version of either fine tuning or with even no fine tuning, say. Uh, so, no, I don't think that's true. Um, so it, uh, it would make the problem more complicated um, but I think uh, it won't, uh, physically it, it, it can't matter, right? Because if we think, if we forget about the mathematics for a while, just think about the physics, why is it, why is it, why is this relaxing? Well, it's really because if the ends are open and I push it and I let it go, if there's some quantum fluctuation that say shrunk it, mm -hmm. and then I let in any deformation that you want and I let it go, it will go back to its original position. So it doesn't really matter, the, the stress will still vanish. It doesn't really matter what shape the ends are. Mm -hmm. That's That's not a, that, that, sh that, that can't change anything. It right. would just so, make the, the, the calculations more complicated. Okay, good. So I guess um, one, one general question I have, which I, I always try to phrase that way, is that uh, in, in a sense, the boundary shape or boundary condition seems to be some sort of uh, IR data you, you put into the system. Yes. And then uh, that that data is translated into apparent some sort of a fine tuning of the parameter in the effective field theory language. Correct. So, um, That's right. So I was I was what so so even though there is no something like some dynamical mechanisms or some symmetries that uh, looks explains where they come from, uh, but I feel that there's some sort of IR data that you imposed by hand, and that seems to be uh, resulting in some sort of uh, fine tuning features in the effective filter description. So, so, I, so I don't know you, if you have a thought about that. Uh, yes, absolutely. So you're right. There is a piece of data. That that data is, is that I'm not imposing any forces that's all, whatsoever on the external sides, right? So if I wanted to get an arbitrarily small gradient term, I would push by an arbitrarily small amount on the outside of the system. Right. 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 But, but as far as fine tunings are concerned, I don't think it really matters, right? In the sense that, imagine I, if I push an infinitesimal amount, yes. right, then that coefficient will be tiny, but it will mm -hmm. be stable, right? It, it, yes. it won't change no matter what, it will always come back. Any quantum fluctuation will automatically lead back to that, to that, to that choice of coupling constants. Right, I see, I see, interesting. Does that, does, does that make sense? Yes, 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 that makes sense. Thanks, thanks, thanks very much. Okay. Um, good. So, um, so th this is all well and good. Um, it seems to be of li limited utility, though, <laughs> in the sense that. Um, it, uh, it only applies to solids. But if we think mathematically about it, as opposed to if we sort of uh, jettison our, um, or we don't tether ourselves to this, to the physics and instead just look at the field theory, it's what is really going on here is that it's the compact nature of, or not the compact, the bounded nature of the target space that is really, um, the, the 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 underlying reason for this apparent these apparent fine tunings. So let's see if we can find other cases. So in particular, you know, the by looking at solids, we found that Tij was zero. But what if we wanted to find T0 zero equals zero? 
well, <coughs> if we just abstract what we did, then it seems like what we should do is be looking for systems where the target space is, is bounded in time, right? If we had a time solid, then uh, we would find a vanishing cosmological constant. So uh, we actually have examples of, of time solids and that is superfluids. Okay, so what is a superfluid? So a superfluid is when we have a broken U1 uh, and we were also gonna break translation. So we break some, uh, sorry, boost. So we're gonna break space-time symmetries. So a real superfluid uh, in say in the laboratory. So in the, in the superfluid, there's some charge in the ground state, some net charge density, we'll call it Q. Uh, and the associated um, current of this broken charge is just given in terms of the one, so pi, pi here is the phonon, which is the Goldstone boson. Not the acoustic phonon like we talked about previously, but the phonon associated with this U1 symmetry breaking. Now in the ground state, we know that J0 has a VEV. And so in fact, we know that, um, that uh, J0 will be proportional to pi dot in the ground state. So in fact, we could write pi as expanding it around the ground state in this way. Where mu is the chemical potential associated with this charge density. Okay, so um, so this is a time solid, right? This looks exactly like a solid, except now uh, in our ground state has this T here instead of an X. And um, if we write down the action, <coughs> then again, um, it will be some P some arbitrary polynomial where we're allowing to, um, uh, we're allowing uh, arbitrary first, first derivatives. And now we're going to bound it. So we're gonna make the target space bounded. So now we're gonna write, this is gonna become D by DX, theta pi naught minus pi. Actually I should, yeah, that's full pi and then L. Okay. Um, so now, uh, what do what do the what does this boundedness of the target space implies? It implies that um, so d pi uh, dx mu t mu nu is equal to zero, and this tells us that t zero i is equal to zero and t zero zero is equal to zero. Okay, so the cosmological constant automatically goes to zero. So what does this mean? And what does this mean physically? It means that um, from sort of the Eulerian picture where we trade T for pi. So if I look at, instead, if I look at the field theory in the Eulerian picture, then um, the boundedness of T means that at some point in time, a superfluid just appears out of nowhere and um, will automatically have vanishing cosmological constant. So I'm still puzzled by this. Um, uh, physically, I don't really have a good explanation for it. I just know uh, that this is what the mathematics is, is telling us. Now, of course, if you really want to solve the cosmological constant problem, you would also want Tij to be zero. And so you would have to work with a super solid. Where now you've broken a U1 symmetry as well as the space time symmetries, the solids as well. And then you would have T mu nu is equal to zero. Okay. Now, and we're not making any claims about solving the cosmological constant problem. Uh, there's clearly a lot of things 
we would need to understand. Uh, we're not even close. Uh, but what's interesting is we could ask we could ask the question: Well, what would happen if we had other fields? So now uh, we have L of some matter fields in addition to our superfluid. And um, of course, if we had L, if we had a piece of L which was independent of our matter fields and or even our metric, uh, which was independent of phi, then this would just lead to a new contribution that we can say nothing about and won't be zero. However, if we insist that L always multiplies some arbitrary function with phi, then this will induce a theta on these terms and then reduce that would cause the net total t total mu nu would be equal to zero. Okay, um, are, there, are, are any, this is sort of a logical stopping point and I could say one more thing before I finish. Are there any, any questions? Okay, so um, let, me, let me point out an interesting puzzle that we've been thinking about. And it, it's the following. So if we consider, uh, the, uh, we'll call us the solid, a rectangular solid, the full theory, and we'll call the bar the effective theory. Okay. Now the full theory has gradient terms and the effective theory doesn't. Now this, this should set off alarms because um, the full theory and the effective theory should be identical in the IR. But there's something seemingly incorrect here because the full theory, this, the full theory uh, starts off in the IRR with gradient squared terms and it's not being reproduced by the effective theory. So where's the problem? The problem is not with the effective theory, it's with the full theory. So uh, the analogy would be, let's consider QCD versus a chiral Lagrangian. Well, the, the, the effective theory is supposed to reproduce the full theory. But if I look at the degrees of freedom, these are quarks and gluons. And these are pions. So the full theory should reproduce the effective theory if you're calculating properly. So in particular, uh, we know that the full theory is strongly coupled in the IR and we need some other description. Uh, we can't use perturbative QCD. So, um, uh, if we did use a lattice, then of course, if we looked at correlation lengths at long distances, then um, we would be able to reproduce, uh, uh, sorry, if I, we looked at correlation functions at long distances, we would reproduce the correlation functions in the chiral Lagrangian. <laughs> so what's going on here? Let me call this L1 and let me call this L2. Um, when L1, when I start looking at distances on the order of L1, then L1 becomes a relevant parameter in the theory, not in the techn technical sense, but um, in the met uh, metaphorical sense. And I have to change the power counting. So when, when I'm looking at Xs on the order of L1, the power counting changes. And now I have to calculate within that power counting if I actually want to compare properly. So um, that, that however that calculation goes has to be that in, uh, that, that in the IR, these two guys behave the same way. So it's not a strongly coupled theory like it is in QCD, but there is a, net, there is a change of power counting. So you can almost think of it like there's a phase transition, not in the technical sense of a discontinuity, but in the sense that the IR behavior uh, uh, changes drastically when you look at distances uh, in the full theory, when you look at distances larger than L1, so, or on the order of L1. So in particular, it goes from having this to be uh, um, leading order in the power counting to this being leading order in the power counting. So what's really fascinating from this point of view is that this operator is irrelevant. Which is really strange, right? This is a really interesting field theory puzzle. 
um, when we have this operator, which is the leading gradient and turns out to be an irrelevant operator in the true infrared. So um, how exactly that occurs and to understand this takes a little bit more work um, and hopefully uh, will be in our paper when it comes out at some point. Uh, so yeah, so maybe this is a good place to stop. So I, I think the lesson we've learned here uh, is that there's some really interesting field theory going on in these, in these, uh, in these, uh, in, in these descriptions of solids which can be generalized and uh, we should explore uh, theories where we have these bounded uh, target spaces um, because they seem to be generic theories where relaxations just occur, they just pop up. There's, and uh, you don't have to do any work as you would say in models with axions, you don't have to build potentials, they just naturally come out. Of course, making them phenomenological is another question um, but it's worth, um, it's worth investigating. So, uh, yeah, let me stop there. Okay. So, uh, thank you, Ira. Uh, and, uh, you may also unmute yourself.